Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin O'Donnell. I'm a member of the Awake Leadership Team, and I edit Awake's uh, weekly blog. I'm pleased to welcome you this evening to Why the Church Needs Survivor Stories, a conversation about the sacred art of listening. It is good to see uh, familiar faces in the audience and some new ones too. For anyone who is new to Awake, we are a growing grassroots Catholic nonprofit founded in August 2019 with a mission to awaken our community to the full reality of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church and work for transformation and healing in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee and beyond. We have a two-part format for our Courageous Conversations. In part one tonight, you'll hear from our panelists, and then part two takes place in two weeks on March 24th, and it's an opportunity for a small group discussion. We'll talk more about that at the end. We are so glad that you made the choice to be here this evening. Our audience, as Sarah said, um, comes from all over the United States and Canada, and there are even some people from other countries who are planning to attend. Whatever thoughts, experiences, or emotions you bring to this conversation, you are valued and welcome here. I want to specifically welcome those of you who have experienced sexual abuse in the Catholic Church as children or as adults. I'm sorry for the ways that you have been harmed, but I'm honored that you are joining us here tonight. Um, please take care of yourself in whatever uh, ways you need to tonight. And if anything in this conversation is too painful, feel free to log off or take a break and reach out to someone who can offer you support. I have a few logistical announcements before we begin. First, thank you to everyone who has introduced themselves in the chat box. At this point, we're going to turn off the group chat feature so we can all remain focused on the presentation. As much as we like seeing your faces, we'll encourage you to turn off your video at this time and change your Zoom settings to speaker view. If time allows, our panelists will respond to audience questions later in the program. If you have a question that you'd like them to address, please send it to Katherine Hours. She's a member of the Courageous Conversations team who has the word questions after her name in the chat box. You can send questions directly to her by selecting her name from the drop down box, doing. the drop down box at the bottom of the chat screen. Um, any questions that we don't get to tonight will help formulate our conversation for part two on March 24th. This evening's event will be recorded and shared on Awake's YouTube channel, but we're recording in speaker mode. So your name and video and chat comments will be kept private. So um, it's now my honor to introduce uh, tonight's panelists. Um, they're going to help us consider the sacred art of listening to sexual abuse survivors and how this can foster healing both for survivors and for the wider church. We will practice that listening work tonight by hearing the stories of our panelists. So let me start by introducing panelist Paula Kempfer. Paula has worked in parish ministry for more than 41 years and now serves as the Outreach Coordinator for Restorative Justice and Abuse Prevention for the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. In this role, she works directly with victim survivors of sexual abuse in the church. Paula is herself a survivor of multiple instances of clergy sexual abuse during her adult years. We're grateful to Paula for being a wonderful friend and supporter of Awake and for bringing her experience and wisdom to this conversation. Thank you, Paula. Next, I'll introduce Father Jerry McGlone. Jerry is a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University. He has been a Jesuit since 1975. Before going to the Berkeley Center, he was an assistant professor of psychiatry at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Uh, most recently, he was the associate director for protection of minors at the Conference of Major Superiors of Men. 
He is currently conducting research about survivor stories to determine which storytelling formats are most effective. Jerry is also a survivor of abuse as a teenager and young adult. He too has supported our work here at Awake Milwaukee and we are very glad to have him here with us tonight. Thank you, Jerry. So let's begin our conversation. I'll turn now to our moderator, Sarah Larson, who's the executive director of Awake Milwaukee. Sarah. Thanks, Erin, and thanks again to everyone for being here. We're, we're just really grateful for your presence. And I know you don't need to hear any more from me, so I'm just going to invite Paula to get us started um, by telling us a little bit about her own journey. So go ahead, Paula. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah and Erin, and all those who are in the work in the background. You know, I just love the work that you do. You know that I support you 110%. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about my personal story. As, as Erin said, I have worked in the church my whole life. And it was when I was an adult working in the church that I was sexually abused by clergy. The first, I, I fr I'm from New York, and I was looking for a job as a DRE in a parish, and I was looking, you know, to come to Texas, but I didn't get to the right area that I wanted in Texas, so I went to, um, you know, Galveston for a job interview, actually, and before I left, um, the priest took me for a ride along the uh, Galveston seawall that was built there. And that's when the assault took place in the car with him. Um, I, I was astounded. I was shocked. I froze. Um, just couldn't believe it. And then he took me to the airport, went home, and I didn't tell anyone. But a week later, I got a letter from him offering me the job. So that was, that was pretty much that first one. Um, the second one, I had worked as a volunteer for, with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps down in Texas in another area, in a small town in Texas. And got very, there were six of us, and we just, we got real close with the pastor who was there. And he was a good friend. And I kept in touch with him. We talked like once a month, and he was a lot of fun and um, just a really good guy. And about two years later, I decided to go and visit him. And I was there for a, a long weekend and he sexually assaulted me during that visit. And it was the night before I left. And I remember the next morning as he's waiting with me at the airport, I said, I think we should talk about what happened last night. And he goes, what, what? Nothing happened last night. And again, I, I just, I didn't know what to say. You know, I was in my mid twenties, late twenties, and I just didn't know what to say. And that was the last time I saw him or ever talked to him again. Um, the third one was when I was working in a parish in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we were very hard up in, in the diocese for priests. We were, were short, the priest shortage was awful. And we accepted a priest um, from the Franciscan conventional order and that contingency base is kind of like you know as, as a um, kind of a year of you know discerning whether we wanted to accept him and incarnate him into the diocese and during that time he assaulted me the first day I met him and thereafter there were several times and I just went to the pastor and I said I'm telling you I'm not going to be alone with him in this building I will not. And I told him what happened. Well, we, the bishop asked us what we thought. And we all said, I don't think you should accept him. And he did. And unfortunately, he was in a small, you know, parish in, in Oklahoma. And a year and a half later, he raped the 14-year-old girl who answered the phones at the rectory. Um, so that's been my experience. I haven't had any long-term sexual abuse. But it's been enough. And you know, I think what I have experienced working in the church with abusive pastors and priests 
who were verbally and emotionally, um, sometimes physically abusive. And that has been probably as hard as the sexual abuse has been. And it's really left a mark um, on my soul. And it, it's hard to get over it. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I'm really sorry for everything that's happened to you. And I'm grateful that for your willingness to come here and, and to share those stories tonight. Um, Jerry, would you like to share a bit from your own perspective? Well, I'm just so, uh, first of all, Paula, I'm just so moved um, and touched and uh, affected deeply by that level of sharing. Um, you and I have gotten to know each other very well and become friends. And just to hear that again and to hear the, uh, the pain that's so apparent is really startling again. Um, it's breathtaking in many ways um, and not in a good way. Uh, it just, um, I, I wanna echo what uh, Sarah just said is I'm just so sorry. I, 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 it, it's just horrendous. Uh, um, and yet, unfortunately, as we're seeing the, the, the numbers of adult women coming forward, it, it, it feels almost that same level of the epidemic, pandemic sort of response. It just seems so overwhelming to me. And so I, I just want to honor your story. Um, I want to Thank honor you. your experiences uh, before I even say anything about mine. Uh, and I'm just very aware of the audience. I'm very aware of what I'm experiencing. And so I wonder, Sarah, if you don't mind, if we just pause a bit right now, because I'm I'm just very uh, affected by what you said, Paula. And yeah. um, if I'm affected, I can only imagine how others in the audience might feel. And so perhaps if you wouldn't mind inviting people to, to, to sort of be aware of that. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. I think that's a really important point. And so I just invite everyone to kind of just take a deep breath. Um, let yourself feel grounded where you are in your in your physical space. Just pay attention to how your your body and your mind is feeling right now, and you know think about what you need to do to care for yourself right now. If especially if you're feeling a little emotional or overwhelmed or triggered by that, so I'm just going to take a moment of of quiet to allow us to breathe before we move on. All right, if anybody needs more time, feel free to take it for yourself. Um, but I think we'll invite you, Jerry, now if you'd like to share. Sure, I, I want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, again, the, the, it just feels so sacred to me that we're on very sacred ground. Um, and it's different sacred ground than we're used to in the Catholic Church, that we can be on sacred ground in woundedness and in vulnerability and in hearing the pain and the suffering of the other. And um, to me, this is a profound moment that is sort of models what, you know, we had talked about in regards to just getting this group together um, and having this event together. Um, I was, uh, I grew up in a very Catholic, Roman uh, Catholic family in Philadelphia, um, one of eight kids, I was a middle kid. And I realized later in therapy, when I was in doctoral studies, that I was more vulnerable than I realized. I was incredibly um, put upon by uh, my father and my older brother who were big football jocks. And I decided that I would, didn't want to be in football uh, after freshman year. Um, and my younger brother told me that, you know, he would never do what was done to me during that time, that it was just severe sort of emotional haranguing and, and real just emotional abuse. Um, it was during that time that my perpetrator, Steve, uh, 
Garrett. He was my civics professor, uh, homeroom professor um, at uh, St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia. <clears throat> and like most perpetrators, he was incredibly uh, charming, incredibly good at what he was doing as a high school teacher, as then vocation director. And, um, but he was grooming me the entire time. Uh, he was taking me out to dinner. He, in Pennsylvania at that point, if you went to Jersey, you could drink at 18. I was more mature looking as I was growing up. So, you know, I was taken advantage of in that regard. And then all the special time that, you know, my dad, who was distant from me during high school, Steve was able to give me. And so it was classic uh, predatory grooming that I experienced uh, and also then assault. Um, I entered the Jesuits because I had a long time interest as a kid growing up in a very Catholic parish to become a priest. The Jesuits were very appealing to me in many ways because of what I saw as the happiness of what they were living and how they were living. But unfortunately, he was the location director and then he suddenly became also a knowledge director. And that's where the severe sexual assaults happened on a more regular basis. Uh, and so uh, for me, what changed recently was I had dealt with this. So I was in doctoral school and researching this issue as shout out to Laurie uh, Delgado from St. James Parish. Um, wonderful to see you again. Um, so I was going through doctoral work there and experienced a series of losses and um, was beginning to grapple with the fact then in years of therapy that I had been abused by Steve, both in high school and in um, my early Jesuit life. Um, what really has become multiple triggers for me recently and why it's become so much more raw is because of 2018, you know, with Chile, with, you know, Cardinal McCarrick, with the grand jury report in Pennsylvania, with Black Lives Matter, and being a Jesuit at Georgetown and really feeling the pain of being a descendant of slave owners. Um, with um, McCarrick in particular, it was exactly what he had done to people and what my perpetrator had done. So it just was horrible. And then the pandemic had just made it worse. And so the isolation and secrecy has just been overwhelming for me in, in these recent years um, and raised some very severe and, and and very important questions for me about my future. Um, I, I think my experience in what Paula is also saying is that, um, you know, it just, um, it becomes really important to be able to just say what happened and to be able to just be listened to. And so I find this occasion just incredibly important and so vital for my own continuing recovery. So thank you for listening. Thank you for that, Jerry. And I just echo those same words that you spoke to Paula. You know, thank you for, for being present here and for allowing us to share in this sacred ground. So thank you for that. Um, again, we'll just take a brief moment to honor your story and your sharing uh, before we move on and allow people to just breathe for a moment. So as we enter into the rest of this evening, I know that uh, Jerry and Paula are, are good friends and have spent a lot of time talking about what they wanted to share with you tonight. And I'm wondering uh, which one of you would like to start us off. Uh, this, the topic of this event has to do with you know, the sacred art of listening. And I'm wondering you know, if you wanna share a little bit about maybe your own experiences of what it's been like to share your stories with others and when it's been positive, when it's been not so great and how do you like to start us off? I, I, I could start, is that okay, Jerry? Absolutely, please. Okay, um, I just wanted to, to say, you know, I wish you never went through that. Thank you. I wish you had never gone through that. And I can feel your pain. 
you know, and it, it, it just is something like you said, the word you used was sacred. It is a sacred moment to hear someone's story. And it, it, it touches us and we need to be touched in that way so that we can be with someone else walking with them in their pain. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, it's not always been easy sharing my story with others. In the beginning, of course, it was very difficult because you were so, when I first started dealing with this um, in 2002, after it broke in Boston, um, I, it was very difficult for me to share it with anyone because I was so filled with shame. And I was filled with shame for the, for the reason that I thought it was all my fault. And I couldn't, I couldn't get past that. You know, I, I began in therapy and then I was also in a support group and we told each other our stories and that really helped because we had all gone through sexual abuse and sexual violence. And so that was helpful in that sense, but to tell the larger community was, I was much more, much more uh, non-sharing at that point. I don't, I'm trying to think of the word, but um, I, I didn't share a whole lot. But I found in my ministry, I worked with adult education and RCIA, and I found in my ministry that it was almost like every two or three people that came in had experienced sexual abuse in one form or another in their lives. And I was able to empathize. I, I didn't share it with them because that was a, a boundary, I think, that I wanted to hear their story and let it be about them. But I, I feel that it happened because I was able to empathize with them. And there was something that they saw that was, was able to trust me enough. And I thank God for that. Um, many of them had never told anyone. And to hold their story and to just, just be with them during that story and listen, listen quietly, don't ask questions, just listen. And when they're finished, then you can say, similar to what Jerry said to me, um, it, it just, just hold them in the, in the sacred moment and know that, let them know that what they have shared with you is sacred and it will, it will be held in, their, in your heart. There were times when I did, um, it was a time when I took this position three years ago in the Archdiocese. There was an article in our Catholic newspaper about it because it, it was a new position. And I remember sending it to my family and none of them knew that I had been abused. And I sent the article to my family. I'm the youngest of 12, I had a large family. No one said a word. No one said a word to me. And it was, it was devastating. I was shocked. And I, I couldn't understand why. I, I just didn't understand why. So I became very leery about who I shared my story with because of that experience. You know, and I knew it took it really took a lot for me to say, okay, you can print it. Because then I was out there. But since then, I, you know, I, I, I'm very careful. I'm very careful not to put me in a situation, myself in a situation where I'm going to be harmed again by the way somebody reacts to me. So, and, and I would say that as a caution for victim survivors, try and make sure that you can trust the person first before you share your story. So Jerry, I know you had different experiences too. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Paula. First of all, isn't it fascinating? Your story and mine are very similar in the sense of, first of all, just trying to find the words, you know, for me were, was really difficult because mm -hmm. my therapist literally confronted me. I remember the moment, it, it, you know, the aha moment when I realized I was abused. Because he said, Jerry, he said, mm -hmm. what you're describing is abuse. And I was like, well, no, he told me it was love. You know, and that distortion that is so prevalent in in the perpetrators sort of manipulating of me uh, was part of the reason why it took me years, even now, to fully comprehend the extent of it. Um, you know, with all the rawness I explained, 
you know, these past several years with the pandemic and the Carrick and everything else, all these flashbacks of, of experiences I had just buried. They, it wasn't as if they were recovered memories. It's just, I, I know what happened. I just didn't see it in the same light. And, and I remember being in group therapy with other priests in San Diego, doctoral work, and how important that was for me. And much like your experience, to be able to name it, to be able to put words to it, was so important, but in a safe place, in that sacred space that you were talking about. And, um, and I think, you know, upon reflection, one of the things I happened to be invited to do a TED Talk at Georgetown, and I talked about, you know, the multiple traumas I had experienced in my mother's death and being in a severe auto accident with my father's death and with my sister's death within a span of four to five years. Um, coupled with my coming to the realization that I was a survivor, a victim survivor at that point. And then um, being in doctoral work in which I was researching sexual offending and non-offending Roman Catholic clergy. So my dissertation chair said, well, Jerry said, we all choose a dissertation topic to make sense of our reality. Um, and a dear friend of mine said, you know, said, this is Irish Jesuit revenge. He said, you know, where, you know, you get even by researching it and by doing uh, intellectual sort of ways of making sense of that, which is just, um, just not sensible. Um, but I think it was the TED talk that spurred this new sort of deepening of my own sort of awareness of what this has done to me in every aspect of it. And the sad thing is much like what you're saying, Paula, is how few of my Jesuit brothers ever even viewed the TED talk, ever even talked to me about the TED talk. Um, you know, and it, it, it's the neglect of silence, you know, almost like, you know, what Albert Einstein said about, you know, it's not that people um, uh, don't engage, or it's not that people do harmful things, it's that people who stand by when people do harmful things that, that really shape the moral fiber of our world. And it's like what we're experiencing with the Ukraine. It's like, we have to stand up to the violence. We have to stand up to the institutional betrayal. Um, but it's been incredibly difficult. I just want to echo what you're saying, Paul, incredibly difficult to, to really feel safe around certain people who just simply don't even inquire about how, how you are on a daily basis. You know, and that's the sort of um, reality that I'm, I'm afraid most Protestant priests and most Jesuits live in. That there's little interest in the other. So why mm -hmm. put up with such abuse? Mm -hmm. Jerry, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, we talked earlier this week, do you want to mention something about the difference between a victim and a survivor? Since we use those interchangeably, we were just yeah, wondering whether yeah. people knew. Yeah, this is something that's really important because um, I was part of a, a panel in London and, and they were talking about this woman from the UN was saying, no, she views all survivors of trauma as victims. And, I just had a visceral reaction against that, you know, because I, I certainly understand the victims of the war in Ukraine because it's so initial and it's so impactful, you know, but soon, much like you and I have experienced, Paul, and see if this resonates with you, the sense of, you know, that initial sort of sense of, of being so violently harmed, so violently manipulated, so violently disrespected and, and, and truly uh, manipulated in very, very, spiritual, psychological, physical ways. That's that first stage for me um, and has been for me in my understanding of, of that term. Uh, but for me, I'm, I'm surviving now, I'm thriving. And so am I a victim survivor? Am I a victim thriver? Am I, you know, I, I think the words we use have meanings and I think we need to sort of struggle with that like before, we began tonight, the issue raised at the University of Notre Dame, are we in a scandal? Are we on an, in an ongoing crisis? Is it a dual crisis of abuse and, and uh, institutional betrayal by our leaders? Or is it just 
an unspeakable, long-going atrocity. Uh, and, and, and so I think we have to sort of struggle with victim survivor and, and, and how we identify ourselves. And I think ultimately, I don't know if you agree with this, Paul, we haven't talked about this, but I think it really has to be up to the individual. Mm -hmm. And we have to respect how they name their reality. Uh, what do you think of that? You know, I, I agree with you, Jerry. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, one of the ways that when I talk to victim survivors on the, on the phone, okay, since it's been, you know, with COVID, it's all been phone work instead of face-to-face. -face, but I, I, I notice something um, when they start to tell their story, I notice a certain level of emotion that's involved in it, whether it's tears or anger, um, frustration, deep, deep hurt, um, disappointment in their, in their church. Um, if, and they're just beginning to deal with that, or they just remembered, you know, I would say, I would say they're probably a victim, but they do need to name themselves, like you said. Um, but, you know, we didn't ask to be victims. There's nothing wrong with victims, Thank you know, you. Um, we didn't ask for it. So I think, you know, when, when you've gone through therapy, I, I don't think you can get through it alone. I don't think you can get to the other side of it alone without therapy and some kind of outside support. Um, it's, it, I don't think therapy is enough. I think you need support as well. Um, maybe some people have done it with therapy alone, but uh, it's so, um, it feels so good to be able to be in a group where you don't have to explain yourself. They get it. They just get it. And I think that helps in the healing process, you know, to come to being a survivor and having most of it behind you. Not that you're not going to be triggered or feel it. That's not what I mean. I'm just saying, you know, you're into the journey pretty far. Um, that That's works. a beautiful image. That's a beautiful image, uh, Paul, because I think it, it really gets at the complicated nature of what healing and the healing process is, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and how we identify that. I know my own case and what you're saying too is how important it is for us to name that reality as we experience it and to, to realize that sometimes you might go back to those raw initial moments, but you're at a very different place because you've worked for 20 years mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. trying to integrate this. And so it's- Or you don't know where, I'm sorry, Jerry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, I was no. just gonna say, you don't know where those feelings are coming from sometimes. Like I went exactly. to therapy years ago, before yeah. 2002, because I was always angry and I couldn't figure out why I was angry. And abuse never surfaced, never came up. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. And I think to me, that's really wisdom, you know, and, and I hope people understand that your, your individual journey is your individual journey. You know, I think we were saying at Notre Dame, Sarah, that when you meet one survivor, you meet one survivor. You know, because that sacred journey is so unique and so mm -hmm. important, but there are common characteristics. But, you know, and in just working with Awake and working uh, so much this year and listening to survivor stories, it's, it brings home that point of the unique individuality of the trauma experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How that has yeah. to sort of manifest itself. Right. Really? I wonder if, um, thank you so much for all of those beautiful reflections. I'm wondering if maybe you want to zoom out a little bit here and kind of bring us into a conversation about just why listening is so integral to, to our faith, to who we are and who we need to be as a church. I know that's something that you both feel really strongly about. I'm wondering if one of you would like to start us off with speaking a little bit about that. Well, why don't you talk about your work because you're on the front lines first and then we can go to academia and research on survivor stories. You know, I think um, listening to another, when I am listened to, I, I can talk about that, when I am really deeply listened to um, by, you know, Jerry's response, by your response, Sarah, I, I know I've been listened to. And that really really helps in my healing to be affirmed like that. You know, if I was to, like I said before, if I was to share my story with someone and they didn't say anything and they just walked away, that's another form of 
re-victimizing. So I think by listening, um, it, it, somebody you know is, is listening to my story. Wow. I mean, it, it, it says that it's important that I matter and that I'm cared for, which is the exact opposite of what the abuse told me. So it means so much to be able to be listened to by someone else, you know, who really cares. Yeah, no, I, I, gosh, Paula, that's just so profound. And, and we, we tend to forget this is the gospel mission. This right. is the gospel mandate. You know, I love, I quoted Tillich in, at Notre Dame, but the first duty of love is to listen. So if we are to love one another as, as we have been loved, then it's about that encounter, as Francis would call it. It's about being present, showing up. Mm -hmm. All the basics of what you all know better than celibates about being in a relationship. Right. You know, half of it's just showing up and listening and paying mm -hmm. attention uh, right. to the other. Um, but it really is the core of our faith. The image I was praying over today, preparing for this was, you know, feeling so companioned with the risen Christ going away from Jerusalem, which all of those broken dreams and shattered sort of expectations and, and just the pain. And Christ didn't do anything other than, well, how are you? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he showed up, he walked, and he listened. Yep. That's the first known action of the resurrected Lord. Yeah. And if that's not a gospel mandate, I don't know what is. Yeah. Uh, I'd, sorry, that's a I'd beautiful it. image, Jerry. That's a beautiful image, I think. Well, every now Thank and you. then it helps when I pray, Paula. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it does. laughs> I'm glad you do it once in a while, Jerry. <laughs> every every now and then, you know. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I just have this image as you're sharing that. I have this image of Jesus coming over to me and just grabbing my hand and say, "Come on and sit with me a while. Let me listen <sighs> to you." What's on yeah. your heart? Yeah. And I think that we are called to be that kind of a listener. Yeah. And it's not easy to listen to no. someone's story and all the trauma that they have experienced. It's not. But we no, can it's... listen with the, with the ears and heart of Jesus. And yeah. Jesus will help us do that. Well, and to see that the image came um, from a recent retreat I was doing with survivors of uh, the preacher was uh, was talking about how you know can we see the resurrected Christ with his wounds and that that wounded Lord that wounded Christ is walking with us in our wounds you know and it, it, it was just a beautiful hopeful mm -hmm. image of I don't have to have it all figured out to be with the wounded Christ mm -hmm. matter of fact he doesn't want that he wants mm -hmm. us as we are. And, and I'm a mess sometimes. I don't know about you, Paula. You always seem together. but No, I'm, <laughs> I'm all together, Jerry. I got it all together. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a big old mess. You know, and, and to me, to be that wounded with my, my God is, is really important. However, I imagine that to anyone else who has a mother image or, you know, is agnostic. Mm -hmm. But just to be part of that... Um, and there's an example I was taught when I was first working in Boston on a, a master's degree. I worked at a Samaritan's, Good Samaritan's hotline. And my supervisor told me, he said, Jerry, you're going to be like every good, quote, person out there. And as soon as a person calls up, and this is a suicide hotline, right? So your first instinct is to say, oh, it'll be okay. Now the person's calling saying I'm suicidal, you know, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. of ending my life. And so my supervisor used this beautiful image of, you know, sailing on the Charles, on the Charles River, that I've, or the Charles River. Um, if you want to make progress, you have to steer into the wind. And so he used the image of, Jerry, steer into the pain of the other. Mm -hmm. And there then, you know, you accompany the other. And I think that's the image for for me of where we are, why listening is so important, that our natural instinct is to avoid. That's why we have unspeakable atrocities. You know, as Langford would say, Diane Langford would say, we unspeakable atrocities means we have to live in that tension that we don't know the words around this, and it is an atrocity. Right. But that tension is really important to just be in. Yeah. 
That's what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus. That's what steering into the pain is, is about to me. Yeah. I um, think that another important thing to remember when we listen to other people's stories, not only is it, is it so such a blessing for us, even mm -hmm. though it's painful, it's a blessing for us, but we need to get out of the way. So it needs to be all about them and not about you. If, if you're listening to someone, stay with them. Don't start sharing your story or what you know or what you found out. Just be with them mm. and be quiet and listen to them. And it's hard for some of us to be quiet. I know I'm, you know, I could talk all the time, right, Jerry? Yeah. You um, got a big amen from this congregation. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, just, it, it's just, it, you just have to get out of the way. And I remember when I was training my RCIA team to work with um, the candidates and catechumens that came to us, I would always tell them if they were having a problem, I'd say, can you get out of the way and allow the spirit to work? And if we stay in, in front of it and not get behind the spirit, it's not gonna work. We yep. have to get out of the way for the Lord to work in us. Beautifully said, Paula, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Beautifully said. Um, I'm going to interject for a moment here and just remind our audience that um, we're going to try to leave a little bit of time for at least a few questions towards the end. So if you have a question that you'd like Paula and Jerry to talk about, you can send that to Catherine, uh, who has the name questions uh, in the chat box. So feel free to do that. Um, Jerry and Paula, you know, in putting together this event, we talked some about the need for the church to listen to survivors' stories and also, but how do we do that? You know, what does that look like? And I'm wondering, I know you both have different experiences, Paula in parish ministry and Jerry in your own research about, you know, how do you think that, you know, survivors' stories can be shared in the church? One of the things that we have done in our archdiocese is if there is a parish who has experienced clergy sexual abuse in that parish and priests have been removed, and whether it happened 50 years ago or 10 years ago, we, you know, a team of us from the Archdiocese and staff, the um, safe environment staff, go to that parish, offer to go to that parish. And the director usually talks a little bit about the history of the abuse in that parish. Not tremendous detail, but he'll, he'll talk about it. And then at times, sometimes the archbishop comes with us and he will certainly address it as well and apologize to all the prisoners because it's not only, you know, there's far reaching victims. There's secondary victims all over the place. We're all secondary victims as part of the church. And he speaks to those and the harm that was done to the, to the parishioners. And then we usually have one or two victim survivors tell their story. And then we're at, we're at tables, round tables, and we do what's called a healing circle. And we give each circle a question, how has this abuse, sexual abuse of clergy impacted your life? And we listen to one another in that respect. And it makes them think that even though it's not on a conscious level, it tries to get to the unconscious level and say, hey, maybe it did affect my life. How? How did it affect my faith? How did it affect my relationship with God? And so we get to listen to each other that way as well. And there's, there's something powerful about that. We do talk about listening with a, 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 the heart of Jesus. You know, how can we walk with someone whose story we don't know? We can't. We can't. You know, and, and how are we not, all of us, outraged over what happened to thousands through clergy sexual abuse? How are we not all outraged about that? And yet there's many that just want to not listen, walk away, say to victims, probably the worst thing you could say to a victim is, get over it. They can't get over it without the community. You can't get over it alone. We need 
people around us, people from our church, from our faith community to stand with us and to be able to sit down and, and even just say to someone, if you ever want to talk about it, I'll listen to you. You know, and you listen with an open heart, with an openness, and you don't judge. You don't sit in judgment on what they're saying. And you believe them. It's very, very rare that an allegation is false. You know, um, well, I don't know. That's some of the things. Paula, that, uh, you, you, every time I talk to you, you, you just sort of remind <laughs> me of how much you're on the front line. No, seriously, I mean, you do such frontline work and I'm just in awe of all that you're doing. But look at that response as opposed to so many other dioceses when, you know, when a priest is removed, they do nothing, you know, and then they don't really care for the, the people in the pews. They don't really care for those who've loved and befriended this person and those who are struggling with believing it. And, you know, so that to me is, is you know, really what, is a good model for possible ways to do that. But look at all the other ripple effects of all the other parishes nearby or all the other mm -hmm. people who had known this person and you know, were essentially misled. Um, right. Not that the work wasn't good, but that there's a major collapse in that. And from my perspective, you know, um, and Deb Rodriguez, hello to you, you know, one of your great minds that I think is really important in your in your work out there on the West Coast is really how do we have a trauma-informed church that really responds to the multiple traumas that we all experience, that we know that one in two people in our congregations have experienced multiple traumas and are trauma survivors. Mm -hmm. I think for me, what has happened in these past several years is that can we develop what I call a new catechesis of of survivor stories or survivors' mm -hmm. narratives in order for us at every level of our ecclesiology, our theology, our pastoral practice, our schools, our seminaries, our leadership trainings, that we always start with the experience of a survivor story. Now, the Paschal event we're now going to be celebrating in a couple of weeks is about a survivor story. Mm -hmm. So I, I sort of marvel at those who said, oh, it's just too tough. I said, well, then what do you believe as a Christian? <laughs> either the either yeah. this cross was the end of the story or it, it was a story of, of surviving trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, it is such a pandemic of traumatic realities that we can be a watershed in our faith communities of really having trauma-informed pastoral care, trauma-informed training in our seminaries, trauma-informed training in our parishes so that we turn this chaos into opportunity, you know, that we can be a welcoming church for those who are survivors. And there might be some who have so been so damaged and their souls have been so raped and uh, beyond repair that we can never repair that wound. But for us to go forward and to be able to possibly have, you know, what I see as you know effective ways to to train our children in safety to train you know uh, teachers in, in in survivor stories so that much like the christ event is foremost in our minds you know can a survivor story be foremost in our minds and i think it's not that far you know fetched to really begin to think about how we can begin to incorporate that uh, much more seriously. Um, you know, it, it, it's often termed John Carr and Kim Daniels here at Georgetown refer to the dual crises of, of the sexual trauma, sexual abuse, and the institutional betrayal of our leaders. And I think we have to look at that, that when we have systemic issues that really have brought this horrible atrocity to the surface, that we look at systemic issues as solutions. And one of them is that we ought to be on our knees before survivors uh, for their courage and, and honoring them and reverencing them in every opportunity we can so that for God's sake, this horror is not repeated. I think the Jewish people have given us a wonderful model in the Shoah project where they remember uh, the stories of survivors so that we never forget. It's not that we wallow in the pain, it's that we never forget and look what now is still happening in, in Ukraine. We don't learn 
unless we see, hear, and touch the wounded one in, a, in our midst. Thank you so much for that reflection, Jerry. And, you know, that's really kind of at the center of what we try to do, you know, with as an organization, with, as a wake. But I'm wondering if you, either one of you would want to kind of offer some guidance for how do we help people who are afraid of those stories? Or even honestly, I think there are some people in the church that almost, you know, they hear of someone being a victim of sexual abuse in the church and they they're afraid of that person. They don't want to interact. They want to hold them at arm's length. And uh, how do we overcome that kind of thing, do you think? One of, one of the things that I suggest, um, especially to, you know, it's just not, it's, and it's not, Sarah, it's not just people in the pews. It's priests, it's seminarians, um, it's bishops. I always say that if, someone discloses to you that they have been an abuse victim, whether it's clergy or not. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Just respond and say, tell me about it or what can I do for you? Do you need me to listen? Because very often, if people have never heard someone's story like this, they don't know what to say. You know, unless they've, they've learned and talked about it from victim survivors. Don't say, and I, I, it, it's kind of funny, but when I spoke to the seminarians last November in our diocese, um, I said to them, if you don't know what to say, don't say anything stupid. <laughs> That's what I said to them. So, you know, they didn't, they what, laughed. They love me so much. Yeah, they <laughs> love, yeah, right. I said, you know, just, just tell the victim, survivor, that you don't know what to say. That's okay. And they'll probably say, you don't have to say anything. Just listen to me. You know, I, it's very uncomfortable listening to a story like that. It's very uncomfortable, but just please don't walk away. And take their story with you. Mm. Take it into your heart and live with it for a while and pray for them. Mm. Sarah, I don't know whether we've asked, I've lost the whole picture except me. I can't, I can't figure out how to get back on. But um, you know, do we answer your question about what to do, how to um, listen? No, yeah, I would love to move us there and to just, I know that a lot of people here might be just listening and thinking, okay, practically speaking, like what does that look like for me? Um, and I'd like to start with if somebody, you know, if somebody tells you their story or discloses their that they're a victim of sexual abuse of some kind, you know, you spoke to that a little, Paula. I don't know if Jerry, you want to add to that, or Paula, you want to say any more, but just, you know, what what practically speaking, what should people do in that situation? Um, Anything else you want to add to that or Paula, or should we go over to Jerry? Well, you know, Jerry, why don't you do it? Yeah. No, I think Paula, you, you named it. I think you, you had a beautiful pastoral sort of model there. Um, but most people aren't going to come up to you and just suddenly reveal, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a trusting relationship. So I think we have to contextualize the fear is what I'm hearing in your question, Sarah, mm -hmm. that, you know, as a, as a trained therapist, one of the first recommendations I would do, I'd say, well, what information is the fear giving you about yourself? You know, can you go below that fear to understand, you know, are you feeling inadequate? Are you feeling uh, that you might do some harm? Are you feeling that, um, that you're not up to, to hearing uh, these things? And listen to the information. I think one of my hopes in this is that we enter the fear you know, as opposed to dismissing it, you know, uh, and I think that's again about entering the difficult emotions of listening to someone who's in pain, you know, uh, like the, the image I gave of the, you know, steering into the pain, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is not what we're taught in our families, this is not what we're taught in our church, that it's in, important for us to sit in difficult emotions, and I think mm -hmm. It's demanding an emotional maturity of our spiritual lives. It's demanding an emotional maturity 
of our leaders, uh, most especially in Paul, I just want to echo what you're saying is, you know, the biggest resistance I get, no, no surprise, is the hierarchical sort of structure. And, you know, as Jim Keenan said, this hierarchicalism that feeds clericalism, that this sense of privilege, this sense of that those in power are the only ones that whose voices need to be heard. It's the opposite. Yeah, the, the message mm -hmm. of the gospel is no, it's the poor, it's the vulnerable, those who are beaten up on the side of the road that we need to go after uh, in the Samaritan image. And I think it just, um, I think, you know, this is, uh, it's okay not to have the words. As Paula said, I, 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 you know, enter the fear to say, I don't know what to say. And the survivor will tell you that in and of itself is healing because you're mm -hmm. not running from me, you know, or I'm not avoiding the story if it comes up in the, in the homily. Or, I mean, wouldn't it be amazing for priests to start preaching about how they've walked with survivors? You know, again, catechetical realities become sacramental in the small S and the big S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Jerry. That's true to bring up the, you know, the, the hierarchy. Um, it pains me when I hear so often that bishops will not meet with victim survivors. They won't meet with them. They won't listen to their story. And you know what? It's their loss because it's such a blessing to be in the presence of a victim survivor who is talking to you and pouring their heart out. Exactly. I mean, when are the when are the bishops going to wake up to the massive impact of the clergy sexual abuse? When are the bishops going to, to start washing the feet of those who have been abused? Amen. We don't get to choose whose feet we wash. We need to wash the feet of those who are in front of us. Well, what a beautiful picture, Paula. You know, and, and to me, you know, what it gets at is, you know, and it's your question, Sarah, it's they don't know how to manage their fear and their inadequacy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my sense. And I've talked about this with, with, with other people. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think, you know, um, just good old active listening, tell me more. You know, mm -hmm. that's what good listening is about. You know, it's not about the survivor. I'm not telling my story for anybody to help me figure it out. I'm telling my mm -hmm. story because I need to tell my story. Right. I need to put words to the unfathomable, unspeakable horror that haunts us, you know, at various times that, that searches out for meaning. That is sacred. Mm -hmm. You know, what your image, Paul, is so powerful. It's like the, the victim survivors searching for meaning. What do I mean in this world with all of this yeah. happening, having happened to me? And how do I make sense of it? you know, with this God who, you know, have to challenge and scream at the heavens and say, how could you allow this person who was supposedly in your altar of Christus to do this to me mm -hmm. and betray him and, and us? Well, I think, you know, uh, I, I can't wait to, to sort of go back to the upper room in heaven and, and figure out what the hell was really going on there. Because mm -hmm. I think there, were, there was a model of Mary holding each and every one of those men accountable. And boy, are each and one, every one of those bishops and superiors and priests who have yeah. ignored survivors for so long, they're going to be held accountable in that same way in that upper room in heaven. You know, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm angry and I'm, I'm Irish, so I won't get, I get mad, I'll get even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By doing good research to make sure that... Yeah. Um, survivors are at the center of our identity, not on the periphery. Mm -hmm. Jerry, thank you for your, your anger that comes through in that, because it's a just anger. Yeah. I really believe that. Well, mm -hmm. and, and you know, to me, an old spiritual director once said, you know, if you don't get angry at God, the relationship's not real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, yeah, you right. know, that, is, that is not a good friendship. Yeah. You know, that, that, yeah. you know, that all of these range of emotions that we've talked about tonight, you know, are really sacred, you know, from the rawness of how we began to the, mm -hmm. the righteous indignation that I'm sort of getting on my soapbox again uh, about, but, you know, um, but also what you're saying, Paula, is, you know, so often it's this culture of privilege, this culture of entitlement that uh, dominates and, and puts you and I and 
most other survivors on the sideline. Mm -hmm. Enough, enough's enough. Yeah. And, you know, we, we forget, and the bishops forget that there's no statute of limitations for mercy and compassion. That's exactly. the least that they can do. We owe well, it. And we owe everything to victims and survivors. And that's why your work is so important, because in your work, and in my sort of research on this, one of the key differences of these past 20 years is many victim assistance coordinators have gone in there and they've sort of dealt with it initially, but they don't have ongoing accompaniment. You know, because mm -hmm. we know that so many survivors struggle with so many other health issues, mental, physical, you know, economic, you know, that need ongoing compassion and care, much like what you're saying, Paula. A one and done approach is, is destructive to us. Yeah. I'm wondering if I can uh, interject here with maybe some questions from the audience. You guys are sharing so many beautiful things that I want to make sure to at least to at least bring in a few of these questions that are coming in. Um, you know, there are a lot of people are asking a question, a version of a question like this um, that I think they're asking you, Jerry and Polly, to speak a little bit about your personal experience and what has enabled you both to stay in relationship with the church um, and in ministry in the church. And, you know, someone said, I could easily imagine the pain of your experience being such as to sever ties to the church. And, you know, as I ask that question, we're very aware that there are many survivors joining us tonight who have chosen to stay in the, in the church and mm -hmm. certainly others who have not. And so uh, this is not a question for preaching of, of the right way, but for those who do want to stay, what has enabled you to stay in the church? One of, one of the things um, that has helped me a lot is the language that I try to use, that it was not the church who did this to me. The church is the people of God. We are the church. It was the hierarchy in the church that has done this over and over and over again to victim survivors. You know, a couple of bishops that I spoke to in the diocese where my abuse happened, they didn't want anything to do with me. They didn't want to listen. And I, I just decided that they, they're not responsible for that. I mean, they are responsible for this. The church is not. I will always be Catholic deep within me. And I, I do what I can if I can't, you know, go to a liturgy on a particular Sunday because I'm feeling like I will be triggered. I stay away. I take care of myself. And I said to the Archbishop when I, before I took this position, that my role is not going to be to bring people back to the church. If that happens, great. But my role is to try and help us heal. Boy, Paula, you took the words uh, right out of my mouth. Um, you know, I think I revealed to you all that I uh, had uh, grown up in a parish uh, in a Roman Catholic family, and I was one of those weird kids who, you know, has a congregation in his, in his head all the time, but I've had that for years, you know, so I've had lots of different people talking to me and, and having fun. And, um, and as, a, as, as a good mental case as I am and I'm proud of, you know, that you know, sometimes the voices talk back and it's okay. Um, but I always was one of those odd kids who practiced being a priest with my dresser, like I had my own little altar and different things like that. Long before I met the Jesuits, I had that desire. Um, and then when I met the Jesuits and was attracted to that uh, spirituality and really the bigger vision of, of what the church could be, that then was a new love. And for me, much like what Paul is saying, the church is not the, the, my abuser. The church is not you know, the, the hierarchy or the institutional framework but it's the people who brought faith to me and, and enlivened faith in me. You know, that, that essentially that's, that's Catholic in, in the broadest sense of what we say in the creed. Um, but I want you to know this, every August, my mother and I would sit down and we'd have the question, okay, because when I entered, I said, all right, I'll give it a year. And so she would sit down with me every year after entrance and say, okay, he's gonna stay. I think for me, that's an, ongoing active discipline I've always had. And there are days much like Paula where I can't 
look at and be in a church, you know, because it's it, it's just too triggering. Um, but again, I'm Irish, so my great, you know, you know what Irish all time is, is we forget everything but a grudge. The way I get even is I do not allow my perpetrator to rob me of what I believe and rob me of who and how I will be in this world. And so that's my revenge, that he may have robbed me and murdered my soul in many ways, but I will be damned if he takes away what I believe. Mm -hmm. Well said, Jerry. Yeah. Well said. Um, I wanted just to read a comment that, that came in from the audience, just as a, a word of thanks um, to both of you for, for your sharing, um, for how personal and painful it is, and just how much courage it takes to be so vulnerable. And so um, this person, and I'm sure many others, you know, want to express that, that thanks. Um, another question that I think is interesting and connected with what you guys were both just talking about um, someone is asking about how many survivors are continually discovering their ongoing process of healing, right? As you said, it's not it's not one and done, you're healed and then you're over it. And then, uh, they wanted to know if either of you would be willing to speak to your own experience in discovering your ongoing needs for healing and maybe how that's changed throughout your life. Hmm. Wow, what a great question, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, Paula, do you want to start with this? No, you can go, Jerry. Okay. Um, I think it's being attentive. You know, we, we get sort of initial skills, don't we, Paula, in therapy mm -hmm. and in really sort of uh, entering these realities. And they're, you know, they're important skill sets, you know, listening mm -hmm. to your emotions, being present, taking care of yourself, um, um, taking each day, you know, what I just talked about. You know, I, it's not just a yearly question I have, it's a daily question I have about, you know, where am I in the church today? Where is my faith? Um, I think one of the resources I've discovered is having a circle of friends who know the real deal and who can walk with me and have walked with me over time. Um, those are precious gifts for me. Um, and those are the ones you know, who I've gone to even recently and a dear friend saying, help me understand why this is so raw for you right now. And, 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 and again, it was that ability just to tell the cacophony of the events that I just talked about. I think going back into therapy has helped. Um, being in groups has helped. Um, and, you know, for me, intellectually, it really is about finding meaning in um, my research and finding ways in which um, that becomes life-giving. Some of my best friends now are professional friends, you know, with whom I engage in, in a lot of different things. And so for me, it's, it's sort of entering more deeply into what has worked before, but then also being surprised by God with those who, you know, suddenly are walking with you that you had never anticipated. And that's what I also learned in grieving in San Diego, that friends that I was with prior to experiencing all of those just sort of natural dyings and losses and deaths and traumas um, that I thought were friends weren't friends in difficult times. And it's those friends who can be with you in difficult times that remain over geographic locations, you know, mm -hmm. and they're the ones who have uh, really saved my butt, quite frankly, um, and call me back to an authenticity and an honesty that is about being present, being a friend, being relational. Um, the other key thing that uh, I was talking to this with my superiors recently is I've never prayed more you know, mm -hmm. that for me, meditation, uh, and I'll use various forms of it, have really centered me in, in a way that I had not anticipated. Um, and so, you know, that, that discipline has been very, very helpful for me. Um, Paula? You know, I, I was telling Jerry the other day when we were talking about this, um, that I was in therapy for three and a half years and also at the same time in a, in a support group of, for victims of clergy and religious for three and a half years. And it, my 
therapist was great because she didn't say, okay, I think we're done. She waited till I said, I think I'm ready. I don't have to come back here anymore. And, but I always went for a brush up like once a year. And I knew, I, I absolutely know when I need it. You know, when I start having nightmares <laughs> about it, I need to go back and deal with it on another level. But it doesn't mean that I'm going backwards. It just means that I'm dealing with it on a much deeper level. What a beautiful image, Paul. Yeah, that's a, I use that same thing. And, and um, going back for those checkups are really important because you don't have to repeat you know, all the, the story and they know the story and, and they're present to that. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. I, you know, that's also been very valuable. Um, unfortunately, we're starting to near the end of our time here and we have some other great questions, but we're gonna just have to uh, hold those in our minds and hearts for maybe some other time. But I wanted to invite each of you to just maybe leave us with a, a closing comment of one final thought for the audience to carry away from today. And maybe that would return us to kind of our overall topic of, of why the church needs survivor stories and that about the sacred art of listening. Is there anything, you know, if you each want to share just kind of one thought to wrap us up, that would be great. Uh, Jerry, do you want to go first there? Sure. And uh, the first word in the rule of St. Benedict written in the early centuries of the church is listen. And to me, when we talk about our charismatic sort of tradition, which the monastic tradition is, that life of the spirit um, is really about entering that unique pastoral and quite frankly, gospel value. Uh, so I leave you where I started with the image of that can we as church, in the image of Christ, companion and walk with those that have had their Jerusalem, that have seen their love killed, that have seen their horrors in front of them and experienced them. And can we just accompany them and listen and make it the centerpiece of our faith together? Thank Thanks, you. Sherry. That was beautiful. Thank you. I, I would say that if you are ever the recipient of someone's sacred story, be sure to approach it with the heart of Jesus and be sure to get out of the way so the Holy Spirit can work through you, in you, in them. Thank you for listening tonight. Thank you. Those are beautiful closing thoughts. Uh, you've given us so much to think about tonight, and I'm just really grateful for your presence here, your sacred sharing, and your wisdom. So thank you for that. I'm going to hand things over now to my colleague, Marcus Mesher, who is on our Courageous Conversations team, and he's going to close us off with some announcements and just a few things uh, to leave us with as we wrap up. So go ahead, Marcus. Thanks, Sarah. Since our intention with this series is for the conversation to lead us toward action, as we bring this evening's conversation to a close, we want to invite everyone to take specific action steps in response to what we've heard tonight. And the first action step is to invite you to join us for part two of this conversation in two weeks. So not Thursday, we're not gonna encroach on your St. Patrick's Day celebrations. But in two weeks from tonight on March 24th, we're gonna gather again uh, with an opportunity to discern and dialogue in response to what we heard from Paula and Father Jerry tonight. Through that conversation, we can support each other and hold each other tenderly accountable to processing these ideas and marshalling them into informed action. We also wanna invite you to our next Courageous Conversation so you might want to mark your calendars for May 12th at 7 p.m. Central Time, which will focus on trauma and resilience in the body of Christ. One of our panelists that evening will be Dr. Deborah Rodriguez, who got a little shout out there from Father Jerry, a pediatrician with specialty training in trauma-informed care. Dr. Rodriguez is herself a survivor of clergy abuse as a child, and she works extensively with adolescents and adults who are survivors of abuse and violence. She's a committed member of the Awake community 
and she was with us tonight. Watch for more details to come in an email from Awake. I also wanted to highlight three action steps just for your consideration. And the first is to make time and to make yourself available to honor the stories of survivors. Uh, for example, I learn a lot from following Sarah Larson's blog, In Spirit and Truth, which is often informed by the life experience and collected wisdom of survivors. And if you are a survivor, we want to remind you that the Awake community is here for you. And there are opportunities like the survivor circles to be heard, to be valued, and to belong. We know that trauma is so isolating. And so part of the intention behind gathering for these sur survivor circles and the courageous conversations is to try to break through and forge connection through the isolating effects of trauma. A second ac action step you might consider would be to invite others to be part of this listening process, this sacred art of listening that we've been listening about tonight. We know that there are power in numbers and through the gift of personal invitation, each one of us can be an agent to help foster the kind of respect and trust that will help us put into practice the vision of being a listening church as Pope Francis has described by drawing near those who might feel invisible unheard or insignificant. A third action step you might consider would be to take some time to get better at listening. For example, I, I love in particular Thich Nhat Hanh's book, The Art of Communicating, which was published in 2013. I learned so much about how listening is an act of compassion. I learned how to listen to myself and how to practice mindful communication so that we can both deliver and receive the truth and love. And before we conclude for the night, we also wanted to take a moment to unite our hearts in prayer. And so if you're comfortable, we'd invite you to join us in prayer. If that's not something you're interested in, you're welcome to log off or to take time just to ground and center yourself. So let us take a moment to remind ourselves that as always, we're in the presence of God who is love, God who reveals God's self as a triune communion of love, love that is offered, received and returned. God who never tires of listening to us. As we heard tonight, listening is an act of love. So we ask loving God for the presence of mind to make ourselves available to listen, to listen for you and the movements of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, to notice the consolation and desolation of our lives so that we can look for ways to be ever more attentive and responsive to your presence and power. to listen for ourselves and trying to grow in self-awareness and self-acceptance so that we can find and raise our voice in an act of courage, compassion, and solidarity. To listen for others in seeking to practice with awe this sacred art of listening to honor the details of the stories each person carries. May we hold each other in our hearts, each doing our part to cultivate healing that leaves no one out and no one behind. Amen. <laughs>